one is when does an unreasonably long uh, commute on you know district transportation constitute a denial of a free appropriate public education constitute denial of a faith and then the second question which the reader doesn't really ask is um, is there any remedy for me to get reimbursed for my private school tuition? And so the separate analysis would be later on down the line. How do you privately place a kid if you want to sue the district for reimbursement? So okay. um, I'm talking to you about transportation, and you'll see I've got notes that I'm reading from, and that's just you know me letting you know that this is really as instructive for me as I think it will be for you. So um, basically... Um, if you have an un unreasonably long commute on a public bus, let's say, to get to your special education class, that can be a denial of fate. But in looking at the cases that I found and some things from the Office of Civil Rights, uh, an administrative law judge is going to be inclined to uh, not grant that, not make that determination unless you've got really egregious medical facts. So this consumer or this, this uh, family is in New York. And so I found some cases from New York law and then I found some from other jurisdictions and then I found some from California. So let's start with um, a definition of what transportation is under IDEA because I found it to be much broader than I had you know, really ever thought about. So one thing it can be is um, it's, it's transportation to and from school uh, and it can also be um, around school, within a school, and it can also be specialized equipment that allows you to get around. So if you need a lift to get onto the bus or a special seat belt or something like that, that all falls under the purview of transportation for IDEA purposes. Um, now, um, people are interested in wondering whether or not they can limit the commute, you know, are there, is there any kind of bright line test under state or federal law that's going to say 60 minutes is per se unreasonable? And the answer to that is not at all. It's really left up entirely to the individual states. There's nothing in federal law. And it's going to be based on an analysis of the specific facts and then the specific unique needs of the person using public transportation. So, for example, um, you know, you could have a problem with the drive distance. That's what the New York family had. You could have a problem with the amount of mileage reimbursement you're given for transporting your own child, which sometimes happens. Um, you could have a dispute about pickup and drop-off locations. Uh, you could have an issue about how many times a year the district will pay for your family to visit your child in residential placement. So, um, these things along with stuff like bus driver qualifications and the um, fitness of the school bus, the age of the school bus, and whether or not the district's conduct was, uh, was negligent, if there's a bus accident or something, that's going to be left up to the administrative law judge under state law. So um, there was a New York case, um, and unfortunately, um, well, fortunately, I guess it played out like this. The, the New York uh, school district had a kid on an IEP that said he was going to be the last on the bus and the first off the bus. So hopefully that makes sense to you. That was an accommodation intended to deal with the fact that he had uh, multiple disabilities, a Down syndrome child um, with intellectual disability and a heart condition. Mm. And so it, it was thought that it was, it was very difficult for him to make this one-hour commute one hour each way, right? This is New York law. So the school district then ran into a problem because another kid needed to be the first off, last on. And so without really doing much of anything, they just notified the first family and said, well, we're changing your bus route. And that increased his transportation time. So this became, um, uh, it became a question of whether or not this was a denial of faith. And so basically the family filed a multi-issue due process hearing request, and one of the issues was, was the commute too long given the circumstances. And what the hearing officer found in that case was that the change had been made by the district without getting any information from a district medical doctor about the safety of it, and that was 
basically violative of stay put. And so on appeal, the um, last on, first off designation stayed in the student's IP. So that's a New York decision. It doesn't talk about um, necessarily the exact same facts as, as your card New York family had, but it does show you kind of what they look at. Now, for the, for the New York kid, there wasn't even that big of a difference in terms of the commute time. It was 25 minutes if he was last on first off and 34 minutes if he was not. But because of the procedural failure on the part of the district, and this is the significant part, the district didn't do it right. The district should have not just made this arbitrary decision. The district should have gotten a, a medical clearance if they were going to change the IEP. And since they didn't do that, uh, it stood. So uh, there's some interesting language in the case. It says basically it talks about um, you know, what kind of factors to consider, and it's going to be a balancing test between sort of the student's needs and the district's needs. Now, I looked at another case that was from California, from Hemet, California, and, and this one should have gone for the family, but it didn't. And again, it was a procedural problem. The student was three years old and had severe reflux. The family lived in a rural area, and so when they would drive anywhere, which wasn't as often probably as if they didn't have a disabled kid with this problem, they would stop all the time and make sure the child wasn't choking because the child had severe reflux. And so the district commute on the bus was 40 minutes and it was an hour and 10 minutes uh, in the bus each way for the child. And, and so the, the problem was that the district was never informed by the family at the IEP meeting that the reflux was a problem and a shorter commute was necessary. And so for that reason, even though the, the hearing officer strongly hinted that if the IEP team had been informed about the choking, they would have found differently because the family didn't give notice, it was found not to be a denial of faith. So there's um, some language in that decision to the, to the effect that um, IDEA under federal federal law doesn't specifically answer these questions about you know how long is too long, and that the IEP team should always consider the length of the trip in light of the student's medical, emotional, behavioral needs. So you can see what you need to do if you've got a transportation problem, and you can bring it up to your IEP team, and you need medical evidence from a doctor or behavioral evidence from a behaviorist or whatever it would be if you had ADHD. It just causes you to decompensate. You know, there would be different facts that would militate in favor of a shorter bus ride. You are going to have to be very thorough and specific and present credible evidence to the IEP team about the, the problem with the trip. So now, um, in, in terms of uh, our New York family's uh, due process challenge, um, as I said, it's going to be by on a on a case uh, by case basis and the administrative law judge may be more sympathetic if you can present facts such as uh, in one case where um, the policy was knocked out because the result was that all the special ed kids were getting to school late and having to leave early. So that constituted kind of systemic faith denial because they were being treated um, less fairly, shall we say, than the general ed kids. Um, there was a case from the District of Columbia 2004, um, a vision impaired kid was spending two hours on a bus ride to an NPS, and this was alleged to be a denial of faith. However, this was something the parent had agreed to in a settlement agreement. And so, the, in, in essence, the short version of what happened was the administrative law just kind of punted and said, well, you know, you should have dealt with this at the time that you entered into the settlement. It's not a denial of faith. And then um, another case from Oceanside School District involving a 45-minute car trip. Um, if you put the kid in, in a taxi or mom drove him, this is a child with autism. But on the bus, it was 1.5 hours each way. Um, and so uh, in that case, actually I'm getting my facts confused. The District of Columbia case was the two-hour ride to the NPS, which was no denial of faith because of the family didn't inform the district of the child's particular health problems. And then the Oceanside case from 2012, 1.5 hours each way um, 
did not um, constitute a denial of faith because the parents should have negotiated for it in the settlement agreement. So I went into some detail here Which because I, appreciate. I, wanted, I wanted you to see that the cases tend to go against the parent unless there's really compelling medical reasons.